Hello, everybody, and welcome to a little lecture recording. Uh, I, it is the beginning of summer, and I am just starting with a large project, and I thought, what better time to get a nice recording of this How to Start Big Projects lecture uh, that I like to do. Uh, you know, it's a PowerPoint. It's a video of me doing a PowerPoint. Listen, I know you're asleep. Wake back up. This one's fun. Uh, I went in my slides, and I added some notes about this, like, example project I'm working on, and I thought that would be a good time to record. This isn't a big one. This isn't a difficult one. Let's just get started. How do you begin big projects? What you need is first, your development environment. You need to know what tools you're using and what technology you're using. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get started and then you're going to throw it in the trash and start something else. Uh, so, you know, d at least begin and make a decision. If you're going to switch tools or engines, you know, you can switch, be prepared for that. Uh, but like, figure out those basics. Next, you need a design document. This is going to be about externalizing your idea. You're going to need reference imagery. You need a systems diagram and make a list of your unknowns. If you have all of this, you will find yourself prepared and ready to get started. Uh, so what is a development environment? What do you care about here? Uh, what you care about is getting everyone on your team on the same page, figuring out what version control you're going to use, making sure everyone knows how to use the version control for switching between like Git or Porforce or some other tool, you know, throwing flash drives back and forth. Uh, you're going to want your backup process in place before you begin. Uh, you know, my, you know, my, I will be auto backing up everything from my computer to my network attached storage, but I have to be aware if I go into my office and do a lot of work there that that uses, I have a different backup system there. Um, and I might, might get messed up. So that's things that I know now before I've even begun. I uh, need to know what project management tools you're going to use. You're going to be in like Monday or Notion or ClickUp or pens and papers or whiteboards and, and, and whatever. Uh, and how you're going to communicate with your team if you're on a team. A lot of this can all just be in one big Google Doc. But, you know, there's better solutions out there. Uh, it depends on what you're comfortable with and what you're familiar with. Make some decisions to get started and get ready. Okay, but that's uh, uh, next is your tools of your project and your technology that you're using. Uh, so, okay, we're using this version of Unity, sure, but like we're using universal render pipeline or high definition render pipeline. Is the game going to be 2D or 3D? Is it going to be single or multiplayer? You probably already have the answers to these questions. Um, but if you don't, you need to just actually just write down the decision. Oh, we're going to use Ultimate XR or Unity's XR Interaction Toolkit or uh, Bearded Ninja's VR Toolkit or, you know, decide that stuff right at the, tart, right at the start. Uh, maybe the most important one, I think, is deciding on your target platform. Uh, so the game that I'm working on, uh, we're going to be targeting the Steam Deck. Uh, am I actually going to try to publish it on Steam to a Steam Deck? I don't know. Probably not. But knowing the Steam Deck, knowing that screen size is going to make a lot of decisions about uh, text and font size for me and how big all the UI elements need to be and how to what controller support I need. So by just picking a target platform, I'm already really well prepared in how I'm going to handle a lot of design decisions just kind of got made, which is great. We love that. Okay, uh, so you get that stuff, kind of the admin out of the way, but like, write it down. <laughs> um, next is the design document, an actual design document. Uh, and this is an overview of your game. Uh, so it's gonna include reference imagery, it's gonna include a pitch, it's gonna exclude, it's gonna answer the question of like, what is this doing? Who is my audience? How do they play? Um, this is you externalizing all of the ideas that are in your head, but also in your teammates' head and your slightly different ideas onto an external thing that is shared that everyone can look at. And is it going to match exactly what's in your head? No. Is it going to match what's exactly what's in their head? No. But we get it on the page. We get it outside of our own brains. It doesn't. Nothing is real when it's only in your own brain. Um, you have to externalize it and discover things like weird little assumptions and weird little gaps that you did, like you you mentally sort of like glossed over. You know, in my head is, is the idea of a, of a truck driving over a pothole. And it just kind of like, if it's going fast enough, it just kind of skips it. But then when you try to write it down, you get, you get these little traps that like you can solve them and you can solve them. But you have to write it down and externalize it in order to discover them. Um, for a video game, probably the most important thing is going to be reference imagery and your core loop. Uh, so what is that core 60 second gameplay? Um, and then your design objectives or design pillars. Um, so my game, which I'm tentatively calling Tactics Above, uh, it's sort of into the breach tactics game uh, in 3D with like a claymation style, right? And I got, and this is, these, these notes here are just like for my first pass at writing down this idea in my head. Um, 
And later I've you know expanded on that in larger documents. Um, that last point of uh, design objectives or design pillars, uh, these are really great to write down early. These are sort of large rules, large truths, large, like this is true about the design. These are specific things. Uh, and the more of these like specific things, you're, I want my player to feel like a kid playing with toys in a sandbox. Like if I know this core loop, uh, this like mission statement of my game that I can write down, um, it helps me make all of these other decisions, right? Just like having knowing the controller only and knowing the Steam Deck size helps me solve all these UI element problems and solve all these input system designs. Um, knowing what I want my player to feel like, I want them to feel clever and smart. Uh, knowing that uh, my game is like an anti-war message because you, you're you're playing with like an independent win condition uh, above a battle where you're sort of manipulating it and, and people are gonna die. Uh, and I've been playing Advanced Wars and like, they just like gloss over all of the death and destruction and like, it's like, oh, you got me this time. And it, you know, uh, uh, play with those ideas. Um, one of my design elements is a uh, low memory or cognitive overhead. Um, I want a game that you can put down and forget about and pick back up and remember what's going on. How often do I put a game down, come back to it, and I don't quite remember the fighting mechanics or what the card icons are. And then I'm like, ah, it's like play a bit and I lose a little bit. And then it's like, oh, do I just want to go play Rocket League instead or Tetris instead? Yeah, yeah, I kind of do. Um, underneath my head, it, my ideas are that players should not feel punished for older decisions. I want that really fast, like, okay, you made a mistake, now deal with it, Tetris gameplay. I don't want this, like, super Machiavellian, I've thought a thousand moves ahead, because, like, I haven't thought a thousand moves ahead, and I just feel dumb and bad when I play uh, games that punish me for that. So it's a tactics game, but it's much tighter, much shorter, much more, like, constant adjustment and and fixing, and less, uh, less forethought and planning. Um, anyway, so I have these, like, big pillars sort of determined and figured out, and that's going to be the core of helping me answer all. Like, as long as this is true, I know I can make other decisions that can go one way or another, right? But if these are the ones that have to be true, like, start there. Um, to why does this PowerPoint slide look different? I don't care. Uh, check out this uh, GDC talk called One Page Designs by uh, Stone Labrandi. Stone Labrandi. Um, and... Uh, uh, from Maxis, and they, it, it's really good. It's, uh, it explains sort of a, a way to do a design doc. There's lots of example images of other design docs, uh, and go go give that one a watch. It'll be linked somewhere. Uh, reference imagery. You need reference imagery. Even if you're making a game that is only audio, then you need reference audio and reference music. You need reference imagery. You need uh, not just for things about the visual style, but also things about like what does the player's input system look like? What's the player's experience like? What's the game loop like? What are the code systems and AI? You know, oh, it has the AI that behave like that other thing. You know, and you can kind of mash up into your original idea. Um, so for my game, here's the reference imagery. I like this a town called Panic in the bottom right, and this claymation style. Maybe I'm going to explore with this like plasticky toys, zoomed in diorama look. Um, and then, you know, Hitman Go being like maybe maybe the best example of something similar to what I'm going for in the top left there. And then Into the Breach in terms of gameplay, it will be probably the closest thing. Although Into the Breach is an incredible game and I won't get anywhere near it in terms of complexity and depth. But, uh, you know, good to, good to think about how you can see what the enemies are going to do and then you make your move. And that's like, I love that. I'm stealing that from Into the Breach. And that core thing that I'm stealing is like the beginning of this entire game project I'm working on. Uh, okay, systems diagram, systems diagram. Um, a systems diagram, I, I'm stealing the term block diagram from the world of electrical engineering. On the left in the top is a block diagram of some circuitry component. On the left in the bottom is a schematic. The schematic is a very specific list of all the parts and all the wiring of a, you know, of a circuit board. Uh, but we don't, we don't want to be that specific. We want to be a little bit higher level. Okay, these are some systems. This is the interface, this is the output, this is the thing in between it, block diagram. So um, that, except instead of talking about electrical engineering and schematics, we're talking about code architecture. Uh, and again, why does this PowerPoint slide look different? Don't know, don't care. Um, what is the bird's eye view of, uh, of your system? And for Unity, we're specifically asking questions like, where does the data live and who is responsible for what information? Uh, and we're trying to figure out some of the unknowns of our project by putting this together. Um, so on the left, I just started thinking things through. Okay, I'm gonna have a grid system. I need a grid system. I need a turn system. I can handle moves. I can handle AI decisions. 
Uh, and then on the right is me with a little bit more detail starting to put together the, the systems diagram of my project. Um, but I'm gonna show you a more complete systems diagram that was edited of an actual project that I worked on. And this was a project that, you know, we sort of started with this. <laughs> this it was, uh, there's a client to host WebGL to host PC, uh, multiplayer game, and then that was talking to an API, and that API was talking to other APIs that also sometimes talked to the clients directly. And that's fairly complicated setup. Uh, so we had different diagrams to sort of figure out like this big data matrix of like who owns what information. And as we worked on the game, we realized we just had to keep giving more and more to the, uh, the APIs uh, to have it be just like a single source of truth. Um, and have the clients basically just be told everything and there would be latency there. Um, so very little ownership in uh, the client. You know, like in a first person shooter, the client usually owns their position uh, and you can update things. List of some of the game systems we needed, um, uh, some of the UI elements that we needed to deal with. We like, took some of the design team's UIs, we pasted it in, you know, use that to reference. Um, so this is sort of the high level overview of what we used. We just like sat and uh, in like a Zoom call with Miro open for a long time, putting this together, uh, a lot, very productive day. Um, later, we used the same board to do sort of the more schematic side where you actually did a flow chart of all this UI stuff before refactoring the whole system. This is not a systems diagram. This is way more specific, very good work. You should do things like this. Um, but that's a nice little, little example of like, okay, we can solve some of these problems, but the systems diagram is a little bit bigger, a little bit more abstract. Um, so, uh, start putting that together. It could be in the form of a list on the left here, or, you know, with more flow charts or the mirror board. I tend to just use lists, um, especially because in this particular game I'm working on, I'm taking my turn system from another game I made. I'm taking my grid system from another game I made. Uh, I already have a pretty good idea of how that lot's going to work because I'm just t stealing from other prototypes and projects. Um, lastly, the last thing you need before you can get started is your list of unknowns. What do you not know? <laughs> Very simple. Um, and this is design decisions you don't know. This is code systems that you don't know. This is code features that you don't know. Um, I'm gonna be using rebinding the new input system. Haven't done that before. Um, systems design, this is sort of like feel and juice decisions. Uh, sound design in my game, no clue. I don't know what that's gonna be like. I need decisions there. But here we're making this list. Uh, how am I gonna do animation? I like the idea of procedural animation or like having these toys shatter into like their parts and doing like a blender physics sim. That's something I haven't done before. I uh, would like to play with it. Uh, is the whole world gonna be procedural? Is the entire game gonna be a roguelike? That's the next decision I need to make probably before I actually get started. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Cause that's a very core central decision here is like how random are the levels? Can they be fun if they are random or do they need to be authored to be fun? So that's like, a, that's a big unknown for me. So I write this stuff down. Uh, the AI system, I don't know how I'm gonna program that. Am I gonna use a behavior tree, something else? I don't know. Um, so this is my blockers, my unknowns. There's another way to phrase it is what is in the way between me and getting things done. And maybe the next step isn't making that big Unity project GitHub repo. Maybe the next step is me making a small little prototype of just one of the systems that I wanna kind of tinker and figure out. You know, maybe I just like rebind some input system and go, okay, and then they make a little menu for it and go like, ah, right, I can figure that out. Um, you know, before I made a VR Minesweeper game, I made 2D Minesweeper. It took me, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours, but I just, I like put it together and then just like thought through how I would, while putting 2D my normal Minesweeper together, how I would like extrapolate that to this 3D wraparound world. Um, and that was sort of the prototype. That was a way to solve some of my unknowns. Um, so, Back all the way up to the beginning of the presentation here. How do we actually begin? Externalize your idea. You are making assumptions, you have biases, you have skips, you have gaps in your idea. You don't know everything. And that's okay to not know everything, but just start externalizing it, especially if you're on a team. Um, research or prototype your unknowns is usually the first step, uh, something in between you and getting started. So for me, I'm going to be making a scene in Blender, not even opening Unity, that will look kind of how I want my game to look like, and I'll try to render it out. Uh, and then I'll try to convert it into URP. Um, so that's my first step, is like play with depth of field and see if I can make something feel right at the small scale. Um, so research or prototype your unknowns. Uh, you know, make a sandbox project, do a little prototype, diagram out an idea for UI. Start with those unknowns. Uh, and then decide on your vertical slice. Decide on your first alpha 
you know, features, right? So for me, my game, the roguelike, the overworld, kicking that can down the road. I've decided not to worry about that. Let's just get a battle game loop done. Um, so I've decided on that, and that has allowed me to sort of cut a lot of the cruft out of my game uh, and a lot of my unknowns out of the game and sort of just focus on what matters. Um, and there, now I'm ready to get started. I'm ready to start stealing those systems from my other projects and start researching a little prototype and just making a thing, right? Um, I guess number the, the last advice I have uh, is to do more game jams. <laughs> uh, how do you start big projects? Well, you steal some of your ideas and code and systems from small projects that you've worked on in the past. Do more game jams. Um, also, game jams are great because by going through the experience from start to finish and not just little prototypes and not just little ideas, um, it really teaches you a lot of the what are things that I can kick down the road and what are things unknowns that I need to deal with now. And that's sort of a level of intuition that depends on your skill set and depends on your development environment and your team and your, you know, your scope. Uh, I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question for you of like what is important to get out of the way to allow you to just continuously you know, be productive when you sit down to work. Uh, and then, you know, uh, my final point on, on projects is make something you can finish. Uh, it makes something that is completable. Cut the scope down, cut the complexity down, cut the number of unknowns and things that you've never done before down and out. Uh, write down your idea for that big game, that bigger project that you don't have the time for, externalize it, and then just put it to the side and, and maybe make some smaller section of it that is finishable. Because uh, if you can't, if you don't scope out projects that are completable, you'll never complete anything. Uh, you know, and and completable doesn't mean like publish it to itch.io. Uh, maybe you know, like me, I make a lot of prototypes that I'm like, great, I did it. I learned this code architecture that was very educational for me. I will close it and never open it again and never show it to anyone. But that's still the you know that's still the process in the project. Um, okay, that's all I got. There's my lecture. I hope uh, I hope that the broader world enjoys it uh, outside of my class. Um, apologies for the for the broken PowerPoint. I'm not actually sorry about that. I don't care. Uh, but now it's time for me to get started on this big project. Uh, so let's go.